Legend Total War here, and today we've got another Legendary Lord Power Comparison Guide, this time covering the Lizardmen. Before we get started in rating the Lizards, I do need to let you guys know that this video is sponsored by Manscaped. For some reason, they keep sponsoring these videos, and it might have something to do with the great comments that you guys have left behind on the previous sponsorships. Now, I could once again talk about how I'm a grub, and how manscaping is not necessarily for me, but for the people around me. But what I'd really like to hear is now your testimonies, I mean testimonies, uh, for those of you who did actually get manscaped. And it might help for those who were on the fence about it, and weren't yet sure, and don't just want to hear about one dirty Aussie's experience shaving their balls. And if you post something especially clever or funny, you might just make it into a future video. And if you haven't yet acquired a Manscaped product, just keep in mind that the Performance Package and Lawn Mower 4.0 is now available in Australia and international outside the US. And if you go to the description and pinned comment, you can get a 20% off plus free shipping and two free gifts from Manscaped. Big thanks to Manscaped for sponsoring this video. This has been a highly requested video and I've put off for long enough and it's time to get in and rate these lizards. So there are seven Lizardmen Legendary Lords, giving them the most Legendary Lords out of any race in the game. And we're going to be rating their Lords based on three criteria. Their prowess on the battlefield, also known as battle power. Their ability to boost their units, also known as command power. And their ability to boost their faction as a whole, also known as faction power. We're not going to be boosting any of the faction effects. Only the things that they themselves provide, regardless of which faction they're actually a part of. So we're not going to, for example, rate Tehenowen based on Cult of Sotek mechanics. That's something else entirely. And maybe we'll do faction comparisons later down the track. Anyway, with that being said, let's jump in now to number 7. Taking the number 7 spot at the bottom of this list goes to Nakai the Wanderer. I don't think anyone's going to be particularly surprised by that. Nakai's always been kind of a joke. Uh, in Total War Warhammer 2. He's never really found his footing. So, in terms of how we're going to rate him, of course we're going to give him three different ratings. There's Battle Power, Command Power, and Faction Power. And Nakai has scored extremely low in pretty much all categories. So, in terms of his Battle Power, this is probably his best skill, and even then it's not very high. I'm rating him 6 out of 10, because while he can do a lot of damage, He's also very vulnerable to receiving damage, unless you really get his ward save and physical resistance into the high 80s, at least. Nakai is oftentimes going to go down very quickly. He's not very fast, he can get bogged down in infantry, he's super easy to snipe, very easy to shoot, and he is just a melee lord with no special abilities that cause mass amounts of damage. And sometimes he can go rampaging. So he's got a skill here called uh, Primal Roar. And while this does give a good boost and can be quite useful, I definitely think that rampage sucks. So, you know, it's a good buff with a, with a downside there. So he just doesn't really have a lot apart from just boosting his stats. But there's nothing here that can actually reduce his size. So that just... With a base speed of 50, he can increase his speed a little bit, but he just he just doesn't really get going. He's not very good in the early game, and then in the late campaign, everybody else just gets way ahead of him. Hence the 6 out of 10. In terms of command power, I'm going to be giving him a 5 out of 10, because the only thing that Nakai really does is boost Croxigors. Now, Croxigors are okay units, but they're not fantastic, and he doesn't boost them by an incredible amount. Melee defense plus 5 for Croxigor and Sacred Croxigor units, that's pretty good. You know, reducing the recruitment cost of them, that's fine, whatever. But in here, there's just not much. I also increase the speed by a little bit, 10%, that's not bad, but there's just not much in here that he does. It just doesn't provide anything good. So, all of his units, he just doesn't boost anything other than, than, um, Croxigors. And he doesn't get any of the special, uh, bonuses, the Blessings of Itzel or whatever that, that, um, most of the other Legendary Lords can get. So, he just, he just misses out on so much stuff. He's got such a bare bones skill tree. Most of it is around making him as good a melee fighter as possible. And even then, he's just not that good. And in terms of faction power, he is getting a solid 3 out of 10, because Nakai does deadly squat. He does nothing. Doesn't provide any bonuses for the faction whatsoever. So overall, Nakai, 
piece of crap getting a score of 4.6. It was a, there was a golden opportunity for Creative Assembly to go in there with the latest update and give him something, and he got nothing. So it seems like Nakai is going to get forgotten for a little bit and can just continue on wandering for a little while. Anyway, let's move on now to number 6. Taking the number 6 spot goes to the new kid on the block, Oxyodl. Unfortunately, despite there being a precedence for power creep, that definitely hasn't happened here for the Lizardmen, because Oxyodl really doesn't provide that much to the faction at all. So let's talk about his battle power. I'm going to rate him 6 out of 10, which is the same score I gave to Nakai, because he's got about the same amount of killing power as Nakai. So... Oxyodl is a ranged legendary lord, and most ranged legendary lords in this game are absolute killing machines. So for example, Alithana, Marcus Wolfheart, Sisters of Twilight. Now most of the time a ranged legendary lord has a huge amount of range, but Oxyodl doesn't have that. His range is only 120, which is a lot higher than a regular skink skirmisher, or chameleon skink but still low compared to just a regular archer. So he has to be fairly close in order to you know, even start shooting. In addition to that, his damage output is actually very low. It looks as though he's got a high amount of damage because it says 534, but that doesn't tell the whole picture. See, with most legendary lords in this game that have a missile damage, their shots are actually penetrating, meaning that it can dish out the same amount of damage to multiple units in a line. So if you're shooting into an infantry unit, you might kill up to 10 of them, all dishing out like 400 damage to, to each of them. But if you're Oxyodl, he has no penetration, so he shoots three shots per volley, and if it hits three different infantry units, it might kill them, but then that's about it. So that damage output isn't isn't quite 100% accurate of how actually damaging he is. In addition to that, if you're shooting at a single entity, Oxyodl is actually not very accurate with each three of those shots. So it's likely that only one of those three shots will actually hit. So it actually ends up taking Oxyodl quite a long time to take out even a basic hero, like a Death Hag, for example and uh, end up having to use about half of your ammunition. Now, of course, he does have Stalk, which is great, but then again, so does Alithanar and Marcus Wolfheart, and the Sisters of Twilight don't need Stalk because they basically can't get hit there so fast. So, he, there's nothing particularly unique about him. He's supposed to be like the unspottable hero, but that's not unique in this game, and he just doesn't have the damage output, hence 6 out of 10. So, a bit underwhelming in that regard. He does also have uh, the Golden Blowpipe of Patui, but this is honestly a pretty crappy weapon. It doesn't do very much damage. It's only particularly useful in a situation where you have an unlimited amount of patience and are willing to wait and do this over and over and over again, because you're going to need to use it about 20 times in a battle for it to be worth as much as, say, the Moonbow. Moving on to his command power, he's going to get a 6 out of 10, because he does do a decent amount for his army. If you're going to go full skink missile units, he's not too bad for it, because he provides armor-piercing missile damage for skinks plus 50%. That's pretty good, so skinks naturally don't have that much armor-piercing, so the missile damage doesn't go up by a ton, but it's better than nothing. And in his skill tree over here, he's able to reduce the upkeep cost and increase the missile resistance of Troglodons, Coatles, and Skink Oracle units. So that's not too bad. And he does have a fairly large amount of campaign movement range, which is useful for catching up to people. He also provides a ton of extra ammunition for Skink Infantry, which is particularly good because you really don't want to run out of ammo with those guys because they don't do much damage. And they, they can go in and out of being stalked. So... Um, in longer battles, he can be quite useful in that regard. Hence, 6 out of 10, I think that's a fair score. In terms of faction power, I'm going to give him 4 out of 10, which is pretty much above average for a Lizardman Legendary Lord, because most of them do nothing. Uh, the only thing he's providing is plus 2 global recruitment capacity. That's about it. I mean, global recruitment capacity is better than nothing, but that's the only thing he provides his faction. So overall, Oxyodl's going to get a score of 5.3 out of 10, being only slightly better than Nakai. Let's move on now to number 5. Taking the number 5 spot goes to the floating toad thing himself, Jabba the Toad, Mazda Mundi. So, Mazda Mundi has one of the most lopsided skill trees that we've seen so far in these comparisons. So, I don't think anyone really expected him to be this far down on the list, and it's, it really is largely due to his lopsided skill tree. So, in terms of his battle power, Mazda Mundi is getting a 10 out of 10, but that's about where his value ends. So if we have a look at what he does provide in terms of that, um, 
he's the only slan that's able to have a mount, which is an ancient Stegodon named Zlack, which is really good, gives him 10,000 health, gives him more speed, gives him a lot more killing power in melee. He's able to regenerate, which is of course really good. He's got Focus of Mysteries, Bound Banishment, Ruination of Cities, really useful. Apotheosis, Healing, very good. And Common of Cassandora, also very good. And Greater Arcane Conduit, which other slands get as well. And uh, tons of Winds of Magic. So even though he basically has to pay full price for his spells, he doesn't have anything that reduces the cost of them, which is something that we're starting to see with a, a lot of the, the newer updates, such as Malagor, where they just cast spells like two Winds of Magic. At least Mazda Mundi has like a near infinite, not really, but he has a huge uh, pool of Winds of Magic, so he can still cast loads and loads of spells throughout the battle. So it's quite likely that in most big battles, Mazda Mundi can get quite easily a thousand kills without taking that much damage either, so he's very good in that regard. But that's about where his value ends. Looking at his command power, I'm only going to give him a 4 out of 10, because he just doesn't do that much. He does have the Sunburst Standal of Hexawaddle, which he can only place on one unit, and is best used in a blob, but I don't know how much you're going to value that, but it provides 10 melee defense and 10% missile resistance. This is probably best used on dinosaur units, which is sort of opposing to his trait here, which provides reduced upkeep cost for temple guard units. Doesn't make them any stronger, just reduces their upkeep cost. Now the thing is about temple guard is that they are not cost effective, especially in the higher difficulties. They're like a tier 4 unit, so by the time you've got access to temple guards, you've got access to dinosaurs. Now the thing is with lizard men is that if you don't have money, you go skinks. If you do have money, you go dinosaurs. And you really only go Saurus or Temple Guard if they're been significantly buffed. So, for example, other Legendary Lords, which we'll talk about a bit later. Unfortunately, Mazda Money doesn't really do that. So, the reduced upkeep cost is useful at the start of the campaign when he has one Temple Guard unit. But then, apart from that, it's not very useful at all. Hence, the 4 out of 10. Now, if we're talking about his faction power, well, the faction leader of the Lizardman race provides absolutely no global bonuses for the lizard men which is a really big shame and this is why master mundy's score is so low he got a 10 out of 10 for battle power and then sucked at everything else which is why his overall score is only slightly better than oxyodal because at least oxyodal provided something for his army and something for his faction even if it wasn't very much so master mundy is getting a score of 5.6 he's just got a lopsided skill tree let's move on now to number four taking the number four spot goes to gorok so this guy here is one of the best defenders in the game. So most melee legendary lords can like dish out tons of damage and that's not necessarily Gorok's MO. He is the best at like just tanking the enemy. He doesn't get a mount, so he never gets any bigger. He's a small entity, so only a few people can hit him in a time and he's very hard to shoot. He's got a lot of missile resistance. He's got a huge amount of um, missile block chance. He's got tons of physical resistance, loads of melee defense, loads of magic resistance, regeneration, loads of hit points, and he can become unbreakable. Very, very useful. His items kind of suck though, uh, but that's okay. I mean, the Mace of Ulamak is not too bad, but the Shield of Aeons I think is kind of garbage. Now, in terms of his command power, he's going to get a 6 out of 10. He does do a decent amount but he only does it for Saurus Warriors, really. He, d he is able to provide extra melee defense when in owned or friendly territory, so that's good if you for any type of unit you've got. Melee defense is always valuable. Um, but in terms of Saurus Warriors, the main thing he does is provide them with 10% physical resistance and 10% melee defense. He's also able to provide the 10% melee defense to Temple Guard units, but he doesn't provide them with the physical resistance. So, in my opinion, I would prefer the Saurus Warriors over it, because Temple Guard are not very cost-effective. So, Saurus can work with Gorok. It's difficult to make them work in the late campaign, which is why he's not going to get a 10 out of 10. These aren't hugely significant buffs as well. He does also provide physical resistance, plus 20% when under uh, when defending a siege, but that is such an unusual scenario that you would actually have your legendary lord defending a walled settlement during a siege. So this is something that's probably not going to trigger that often, and it will not apply to the garrison. It only provides to any units that he himself is commanding, which includes himself. So it's not that valuable, but it is something to take into consideration. So overall, I think a 6 out of 10 
is fairly decent for his command ability. And in terms of his faction power, well, he's joining the club of 3 out of 10 because he provides fucking nothing. He doesn't provide any global bonuses at all, which is why he's getting the 3 out of 10. So overall, Gorok's score is going to be 6 out of 10. And I think this is the, the main theme with the Lizardmen Legendary Lords, is that none of them are providing any global bonuses. And this is why their scores are so low. Anyway, let's move on now to number 3. Taking the number 3 spot goes to Tic-Tac-Toe. Now this is somebody that I think most people would have expected would go lower down on the list. And I probably would have lowered it quite significantly if a certain Doomstack has, wasn't sent in to me fairly recently. Which significantly boosted Tic-Tac-Toe's score. Anyway, let's firstly talk about his battle power. Now people often give me a bit of flack for always giving Legendary Lords very high scores in their battle power. And there's a reason for that. Because I've been always aware that there are some Legendary Lords in this game that just don't have very good battle power. And it's important to be able to make a distinction to that. And now we can, because Tic-Tac-Toe is going to get a 4 out of 10 for his battle power. He sucks. He has no spells. He's not a ranged unit. Doesn't have any additional mounts apart from this Ripodactyl. And his stats just aren't very good. He can't beat any other melee lords in melee in the game. Any flying lords will beat the crap out of him. He goes up against a paladin on a a um, pegasus, he will lose. The only thing he can basically beat in melee are really like flimsy wizards that are you know, good spellcasters but not good in melee. That's about all he can do. He's not tanky. He's just, he's just not... He's really a support unit. He's just not very good in melee. Anyway, where Tic-Tac-Toe's strength really lies is in his command ability. Now, prior to the patch, I probably would have given him like a 5 out of 10 for his command, but now I'm going to have to give him a 10 out of 10, because I've seen what Doomstack it's possible to make with Tic-Tac-Toe, and I'd highly recommend going for that if you want to make him really good. And it comes down to Coaddles. Even though Coaddles are a very derpy unit, giving him a spam of them can be extremely powerful. So... It comes down to him being able to boost them by a ton and also reduce their upkeep costs because Lizardmen aren't the richest faction in the game by a long shot. So having a Doomstack that barely costs you anything is really beneficial for them. So if you look at the Eye of the Heavens trade here, it reduces their upkeep cost by 50%. Also with Pterodon Riders and Ripodactyls, but really I don't care about those units that much. It all comes down to the Coaddles. So 50% there, you've got 15% here through Geomantic Sustenance, 8% here, Blessing of Itzel for another 20%, there's a, a follower that you can get by winning ambushes that'll give you 10%, and there's also a technology that'll reduce it further. And then there's a Cult of Sotek, which can make anything free, essentially, but that's, a, that's another thing entirely. So it is possible, even on Legendary Difficulty, to have Tic-Tac-Toe have completely free um, coaddle units, subject, of course, to supply lines. Once you've got like five or six supply lines, obviously they're going to be quite expensive again. But you know, cheaper than Stegodons, at least. Now, in terms of the stat boost that he provides, he's able to provide melee attack when in foreign territory, leadership plus 10. With precision strike, he provides an additional 10 leadership when attacking and 5 melee attack when attacking. Aerial superiority over here provides physical resistance and speed for coaddle units and ammunition in addition to uh, pterodon riders and ripodactyls, which again, don't really care about them. So in terms of his command ability, since he's got such a good doom stack, I'm going to have to give his command ability 10 out of 10 because he's really the only Lizardman legendary lord that's able to make a coaddle doom stack quite that good. Now in terms of his faction power, he doesn't do nothing, which is really good for a Lizardman. So what he does do is provide plus three public order right off the bat, because he starts off with the Blade of Ancient Skies. So plus three public order, all provinces, very useful. And then he's able to provide uh, plus two hero capacity for Skink Chiefs, which is pretty good. It's, it's not nothing. You know, it's not worthy of a 10 out of 10, but it's, it's pretty good considering his faction leaders uh, don't provide anything, really. So 7 out of 10 for Tic-Tac-Toe. Overall, Tic-Tac-Toe is going to get a 7 out of 10 score, which, in terms of, like, average for every Legendary Lord in the game, that's a pretty average score. So he's above average for the Lizardmen, but average in terms of everybody else. So terrible melee combatant, amazing commander. Let's move on now to number two. Taking the number two spot goes to Tehenowin. So let's talk about his battle power. I'm going to give him a 10 out of 10. This is primarily where most of his uh, power lies. Because 
in the later stages of the campaign, when you've got him on an ancient Stegonon Engines of the God, this is one of the best mounts in the game. Not only is it an amazing melee combatant, but it's also got that special solar beam cannon thing that absolutely eradicates infantry units. It doesn't cost any Winds of Magic to do that as well. Plus, it also helps to generate more Winds of Magic and provide ward save to those around them. He's also a Lore of Beast caster, which isn't a great Lore of Magic, but Flock of Doom is alright. You've got some buff spells and debuffs in here that if you want to use that, you can do it. But if you do want to go down his magic line, the main benefit, I suppose, is just getting extra magical reserves and an arcane conduit. So if you've got other spell casters in the army, such as the Lore of Heavens, even if you don't want to use his specific spells, even though he does cast them 10% cheaper than a regular beast caster, um, at least he can support other spell casters in his army. But overall, he definitely warrants a 10 out of 10 just because he's able to dish out tons of damage and be super tanky with the Ancient Stegodon Engines of the Gods. And now that you're able to actually put a Skink Oracle into your army for healing, you've actually got the capability of giving to Henowen regeneration over time with uh, Earthblood, which again, this is why the Arcane Conduit would come in handy. Now in terms of his command power, Tehenowin does a lot for weak units. He provides physical resistance and leadership for, um, for skinks. I just don't value skinks that much. Very useful in the early game to have this, but in the late campaign, you're probably going to phase those units out, probably. So he's got two skills in here that are mutually exclusive. If you go down the fanatic line, um, it blocks off the promises of reconstruction. Now, personally, I prefer going down the promises of reconstruction, but... Over here, basically, this provides extra stats for your Skinks and also for Bastilodon's Arc of Sotex, which I don't value them that highly either, but they're okay. And if you go over here, you can make them cheaper. So it's either cheap Skinks or tougher Skinks. But either way, I usually want to go at least to the Stegodons or above. Um, I'm not a big fan of Bastilodon's, so that's why I've only rated him 5 out of 10 for command power. A lot of stuff that just doesn't really provide a huge impact in the late campaign. In terms of faction power, Tehenowin provides a 7 out of 10 score. So with the Pluck of Sotek, he's able to get plus 3 public order to all provinces, which is very good. The Lizardmen don't need an abundance of public order because they can essentially have unlimited because their Sora Scar veterans and Old Bloods have the Honored Elder ability at rank 20, so you can essentially infinitely increase your public order. So it's good, but you don't need it. And then with Promises of Reconstruction, you can also get an additional public order. He pro also provides tax rate in the local province, so that's very useful if you sit him in particularly rich provinces, which is not what I would advise doing for, for a long term, but still providing some money extra is better than nothing. Um, does provide, you know, extra bonuses for the faction. And then over here at Enlighten, he's able to provide one extra global recruitment capacity and sacrificial offerings, which is only going to be beneficial if you're playing as the Cult of Sotex. If you're playing as Hexavartal and you confederate um, to Henowin, that's only, you're only going to get the benefit out of the global recruitment capacity, hence only 7 out of 10. He does do a lot, it's just that you don't need what he provides, which is why he doesn't get the 10 out of 10 there. So overall, Tehenowin's going to get a 7.3 out of 10, which, despite being the second best Lizardman Legendary Lord, a 7.3 out of 10 is not that high of a score, but he's still a decent Legendary Lord. Anyway, with that being said, let's move on now to the number one Lizardman Legendary Lord. Taking the number one spot goes to Krokgar. So Krokgar is the best Lizardman Legendary Lord because he does a little bit of everything. Let's talk about his battle power firstly. He's going to get a 10 out of 10. He's a melee lord. Definitely not a spellcaster, even though he does have access to a spell. If you get Hands of the Gods, uh, you get essentially two casts of Hands of the God, which is the... Pretty much identical to overcasted Shem's Burning Gaze. There's no chance of over uh, of miscasting, so it's pretty good. So his equipment provides him with good amounts of stat bonuses, which is very useful. And he's got an extremely good mount, Grimlock. So Grimlock being a Carnosaur, that doesn't go into Rampage, which is very useful. Uh, he's able to take down most monstrous units in the game, no problem. He's able to duel smaller units, no problem. And in big groups of melee infantry, he can hit and run quite well. So he's very well suited for it. And now that he can have a Skink Oracle attached to his army, he's also able to regenerate hit points quite easily. So Krokgar is easily going to provide tons of value to you in every single battle that you use him in. In terms of his command power, I'm going to be giving him an 8 out of 10, because he does a little bit of everything, but to begin with, he primarily 
benefits Saurus Warriors and Cold One units, but forget about Cold Ones because they're rubbish. So reducing upkeep costs by 50% for Saurus Warriors, that's pretty good. I wouldn't rate it highly if that was all he did, but it's not all that he does. He does a lot of other things as well. Ambush success chance plus 25%, very useful. Leadership plus 10 for his army, also very useful. And with Ancient Spawn down here, which is sort of like his secondary trait that he gets, uh, he provides armor for all the dinosaur units, which is good. It's not a lot, but it's good. And also an additional leadership for them, which stacks with this. So your dinosaurs under his command are getting close to unbreakable. Then, if you look at his specific skill sets here, where it's Annihilate the Beastmen, Skaven, Dark Elves, Greenskin, Dwarves, Chaos, Undead, Mankind, the only factions that aren't included here are basically the High Elves, which you shouldn't be going up against, and the Lizardmen, which, again, you shouldn't be going up against, uh, and the Wood Elves, I suppose, which, again, you shouldn't be going up against. Um, shouldn't worry too much about them. Anyway, so what these skills here provide is Weapon Strength, when going up against that particular enemy, it gives Krokgar extra melee attack, his army weapon strength, and provides a global bonus plus 8 of leadership when fighting that race, which I believe also applies to your garrisons. So very useful to get all of these skills if you intend to essentially conquer the world. So this is where he's getting the majority of his points for, at, for his command power, because he provides every unit in the roster, you, whether you decide to go for a doom stack or a balance stack, with weapon strength, leadership, and melee attack for himself. So those are very useful. In terms of his faction power, he's gonna get another eight out of 10. He doesn't provide a ton of really important abilities, but again, with the leadership here, fighting against those uh, specific races for all of your armies and I believe all of your garrisons. Uh, this is particularly useful. It's not huge, but it provides it to a lot of things. And then with the Revered Spear of Tlanxla, don't know if I pronounce that right, plus three public order all provinces, which is very good, and then Honored Elder, which all Sora Scar veterans and Old Bloods get. Uh, is one additional public order. So it doesn't provide huge bonuses to the faction. He provides lots and lots of little bonuses, which are very useful. And then, of course, you've got these blessings down here as well, which is common for Soros Old Blood, so they're not necessarily unique to him. So overall, Krokgar is going to be scored an 8.6 out of 10. He's a solid legendary lord, but there are no 9 out of 10s, no 10 out of 10s for the Lizardmen. Unfortunately, their, their uh, Lizardmen legendary lords just aren't quite up to scratch with other races, which is why quite often you'll see their legendary lords just left in the recruit pool and life slants taken the command because of the life magic being so useful. So that's my rating for the Lizardmen Legendary Lord. This has been one that's been requested for quite a while. One that I was reluctant to do because I knew I was going to have to rate them all very low. Because unfortunately they just don't really do much. I was hoping that the latest update was going to give them a little bit more. And definitely boosted Tic-Tac-Toe. But everyone else was kind of just left behind here. The Lizardmen really didn't get much out of the DLC apart from some new units. But no reworks for them yet. They still a good race. Just not as good as some of the other ones that's all anyway that's my list let me know in the comments below whether you agree or disagree with this and uh i appreciate you guys and i'll see you next time fuckers bye